Well, let's get started. Welcome to today's Farm to School Purchasing Grant Application Webinar. My name is Claire Finnerty, and I'm the Farm to School Purchasing Grant Specialist with the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Farm to School Program. This webinar is for eligible applicants and partners in Farm to School. The webinar is being recorded. A link to the recording and presentation slides will be posted to the Purchasing Grant website. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. You may also type your questions into the chat box, which Annette, our WSDA Farm to School lead, will be monitoring throughout the presentation. I wanted to start by introducing the Washington State Department of Agriculture. Our mission is to support the viability and vitality of agriculture while protecting consumers, public health, and the environment. In our regional markets program, specifically, we support small farmers who sell directly to their customers, including schools and childcare centers. By being a part of this grant and choosing to buy local, you can make a huge difference in the livelihoods of small farmers in your community. WSDA's Farm to School program promotes farm to school connections and is dedicated to fostering relationships between schools and agricultural producers in Washington State. We're here to support you in your farm to school connections with the training and resources listed above. We also provide the farm to school purchasing grants, which is why we're all here today. Here's our agenda for today's call. Again, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time and we'll have a Q&A at the end. We want to thank OSPI for their support in grant administration for the first two rounds of the grant. In this 2023-2025 biennium, WSCA is offering $4 million in the Farm to School Purchasing Grants from the Federal COVID Recovery Funds and from the State General Fund. We are grateful to the longtime partners and advocates who have been pushing for this investment for many years. We know one of the biggest barriers to farm to school purchasing is limited budgets, which is why we're excited to be able to offer this grant. We hope these grants will help accomplish WSDA's dual goals of expanding opportunities for farmers and increasing access to healthy Washington grown food for youth in our state. This is a competitive reimbursement grant, meaning that grantees must pay for products before requesting reimbursement. A few of the key goals of the Purchasing Grant Program are to support the development and sustainability of farm to child nutrition program efforts, increase the amount and variety of local foods served in school meals and child nutrition programs, increase purchasing from small and mid-size as well as socially disadvantaged beginning limited resource women and veteran farmers and ranchers. There are three program types that you can apply for. School districts are welcome to apply to all three. Please note that school meals grant funds cannot be used for SF, SP or SSO. You must apply to the summer meals grant to use funding in the summer. And child, court, child care organizations do not need to apply for the summer meals application because we know that childcare meals are year round and have calculated the maximum funding request accordingly. Just to let you know, this star means anywhere you see a star in the presentation means that this is a change from last year's grant program. So if you were a grantee last year, look out for those stars for changes. We are currently in round one, which is now open and closes September 25th. This funding period is from November 2023 to June 2025, giving you the opportunity to plan ahead with farmers and make purchases during the abundant summer season next year. If you are awarded for round one, you're not eligible for round two. However, if you need to wait or you're not awarded in round one, you can look out for round two applications in the spring of 2024. 
Please note that these timelines are subject to change. So who is eligible to apply for the school meals application? Tribal schools are eligible and organizations that operate the MSLP program. For the child care meals application, tribal early learning centers are eligible and organizations that operate CACFP. That's for schools and early learning only. Program operators of adult care food programs and at-risk after-school meal programs are not eligible. Organizations that oversee multiple family daycare home providers are eligible to apply, but those individual providers cannot apply on their own. Keep in mind, organizations applying for school meals or child care meals must have operated their program for at least one year prior to application. Summer meals, this is new, so tribal schools are eligible, and summer food service program and FEMA summer option for school districts only in this round. So community SFSP operators are not eligible this round, but they will be eligible in round two, which opens up in the spring for next summer. If there's anyone here who is unclear uh, if their organization is eligible or not, you can enter your question into the chat and, and that can help you make that determination. It is important to note that upon award, grantees will be required to have a statewide vendor pay number and a unique entity identifier number in SAM.gov. These are requirements for awarded grantees and are not required during the application process. However, we do recommend obtaining the numbers as soon as you can not to delay payment if you are awarded. The statewide vendor pay number is required in order to receive reimbursement payments from WSDA through the statewide vendor system via check or electronic funds transfer. You can contact your business office to find out if your organization has a statewide vendor number or for help requesting one, and they are free. I've also included the link here. Registering for a unique entity identifier number in SAM.gov is also a requirement of the grant. This helps us to determine if your entity can receive federal funds and is not currently suspended or debarred. I've included the link here to create an account. And again, there's more detailed directions in the application itself. So how much can you apply for? Maximum funding request amounts are based on meal count. Let's start with school meals. So if you're a small school serving less than 20,000 lunches in October of 2022, then your maximum funding request is $40,000. If you're a large district with more than 20,000 lunches served in October of 2022, then you will use this specific calculation. For example, if you serve 50,000 lunches, you would multiply that by 18 and by 0.2, and your maximum funding request would be 108,000 for the entire grant period. Remember that this is a maximum, and you may request less than the maximum. Please be realistic with your total requested funding amount based on planned purchases. All right, let's look at child care meals maximum funding requests. So again, if you're a small child care center serving less than 4,000 lunches in October of 2022, then your maximum funding request is $10,000. However, if you're a large child care organization serving greater than 4,000 lunches in October of 2022, then you will use the following calculation. For example, if you serve 6,000 meals in October, multiply by 20 and 0.2, and your maximum funding request 
is $14,400. And then finally with summer meals, the maximum for a small program is 1,000 and a large program is following this calculation. So for example, if you served 10,000 lunches in July of 2023, multiply by two and then by 0.12, to get your maximum funding request of $2,400. So there are two opportunities inside of the application to double check your calculation of maximum funding request, which I'll touch on later. But if you need support or wanna triple check, you can reach out to me. What kinds of foods can you buy with these funds? You can purchase whole and minimally processed fruits, vegetables, herbs, meats, seafood, legumes, and grains that are 100% grown, raised, caught, or foraged in Washington state. Minimally processed includes refrigerating, slicing, dicing, watching, washing, or packaging. It's important to note that you can define local in many ways, but for the purpose of this grant, Local is defined as grown, raised, caught, or foraged within Washington state. In terms of fully processed foods, such as bread products or dairy, the primary ingredient, which is the largest ingredient by weight or volume, must be 100% grown in Washington. For example, Yogurt containing milk from cows 100% raised in Washington, or pizza dough containing flour from wheat 100% grown in Washington. This is a change from last year when we required 51% of all ingredients in a product to be Washington grown, meaning that not all products approved last year will qualify. We made this change to ensure that these grant funds are being spent on Washington grown foods and increase purchasing from small farms rather than large manufacturers who may not be able to provide transparency of their products. We've also made this change to diversify products and encourage grantees to purchase items not already purchased on a regular basis. We like to say that these are special funds for special foods and every dollar you spend has value and can support a resilient local food system. Upon award, it will be your responsibility to determine and ensure that the products you request for reimbursement are eligible and meet the requirements. This new form, the Washington Grown Food Product Verification Form, is on our website under the Grant Guidelines page if you want to get a head start and reach out to potential vendors. Eligible food products can be sourced from a variety of direct and indirect sources. Direct options include from a farmer, rancher, or fisherman, from farmer's markets and farm stands, or from your school garden or farm. But remember, of course, you can't buy an avocado from a farm stand that was grown in Washington or grown in California. Um, the the product still has to be grown in Washington. Some, we do highly encourage buying products directly from Washington farmers and food producers. You may also purchase Washington grown foods from grocery stores or other retailers, as well as your prime produce or broadline distributor. If you're purchasing from an indirect source, be sure that the product or vendor provides information about the original farm source. Upon award, you will need to demonstrate that all the products you have purchased were grown in Washington. Supporting documentation may include the product label, receipts, and invoices with the farm name and or the address. As a reminder, Grantees must follow all applicable federal and state and local procurement rules and regulations when purchasing food for reimbursement with the grant funds. 
The farm to school purchasing grant may also be used to cover non-food costs in addition to direct food purchases. Non-food costs must directly support the development and sustainability of farm to school efforts to purchase and promote foods grown and raised in Washington state. Awardees may request up to 25, sorry, applicants may request up to 25% of their total requested amount on allowable non-food costs, such as equipment, materials, and supplies. For example, you could ask for a freezer to store additional local produce um, or protein for year-round use. You could ask for a salad bar to promote locally grown greens and produce in whole or minimally processed form, a food processor to prep local whole produce into slice and dice forms, and the list goes on. We, you can double check the grant guidelines on our webpage if you want to look at more examples. So staff time could be used to administer the grant or increase kitchen staff time to process local whole foods. Transportation costs like delivery fees or mileage to pick up food from a farm. And then finally, travel costs to attend farm to school trainings. For the application, you'll need to be specific with the non-food costs you're requesting. During the application review, the non-food costs will be reviewed and approved or not approved. So if changes occur during the grant period and you want to purchase something different, you'll need to request this change in writing before purchasing a different item. Expenses that are determined to be ineligible will not be approved for award. This includes food expenses that are not Washington grown, purchases that are made before the funding period or after the funding period, Washington produced fluid milk, including fluid milk substitutes. And the reason for excluding milk um, is to encourage new vendor relationships with the diversity of Washington farms and to incorporate new products beyond what is already commonly purchased. You cannot purchase products that are already purchased through DOD Fresh, USDA Foods, um, and other grant programs. And you cannot ask for non-food costs that are not directly supporting your farm to school efforts. So this is the application checklist. Start by reading the grant guidelines. We're going through a lot of the information today, but you will need to read through it thoroughly from start to finish. Next is to watch the how to apply video and read the how to apply flowchart, which are coming soon to our website. And they talk more about the, the technical aspects of using our submission portal. Number three is to create an account in the application portal. This is new. The application is no longer in iGrants. Four is to complete the profile. Five is to complete the application for each program type you're applying for, which would be school meals, child care meals, and or summer meals. Within that application is a food purchasing plan. And then six is complete the non-food cost budget section if you're requesting non-food costs. And finally, most importantly, click the submit button by Monday, September 25th, which is the deadline. Okay, so you will go to our, to create an account, you will go to our application portal, uh, create an account by clicking sign up. And please note that only one account login is allowed per application. If you're applying for multiple program types, the school meals, childcare meals, and summer meals, you'll have to decide how many accounts. So organizations applying for more than one type will complete separate applications for each program. This can be done from a single account 
or by creating separate accounts with unique logins. If different people are responsible for the different program applications and management of the grant, we recommend creating separate accounts for each program application type. So for example, if you're a school district applying to school meals and childcare meals and summer meals, and there's only one food service director, then I would recommend to just have one account login. If you're a school district that's applying to school meals and childcare meals, and there's two different managers for those two different programs, then I would go ahead and create two separate logins. All right, we are going to now work on the application portal. So this is what it looks like. And I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. So if you learn in a different style, I would definitely recommend just hopping into the, the submission portal and following the instructions. They should be pretty straightforward, but I'm gonna walk through them quickly today. One important thing to note is that our submission portal can be translated into nine different languages if you click this globe button at the top right. So once you sign in, this is what the homepage looks like. You'll see the application checklist again, and you will see create a profile to get started. So you will click on this button and that will take you to the profile. I'm not gonna go through the entire profile today. It's mostly contact information, but I did want to point out this last section of the profile which is new this year. It's the Administrative Financial Capability and Accounting Systems Assessment. So responses to these questions will be used to determine the applicant's level of risk. So the applicant's level of risk will determine grant reporting and monitoring requirements, such as how often you need to turn in receipts and documentation. All grantee, all grant beneficiaries are subject to random desk review, and assessment questions are not part of the scored application. So this section should be filled out by your authorized representative at your organization. Once you've completed the profile, this is what your homepage looks like. You'll see that you can open your profile at any time and, and edit it. Next is your application. So you'll see this application, uh, this application card here and you'll click get started. This will take you to the application intake page. You will see that the application itself is here. So you'll click edit. This is what the application itself looks like. You see the eligible applicants again, just to refresh your memory and make sure you're definitely eligible before you start applying. The first question is, which program are you applying for? School meals, childcare meals, or summer meals? So you'll only select this once. Do not change the selection after you begin filling out the application. To apply for an additional program type, you'll save this application, return to the homepage, and click Add Another, which I'll show you later. One part of the application to note is this question on how does your organization handle food service? So if your organization is self-operated, that is great and you will just keep moving on. If your organization is managed by a food service management company, vended meals, or you're a part of a school to school agreement, then you'll have an additional question to answer. So you'll see this long answer question about describing how you'll work with the food service management company to comply with your existing contract and the grant guidelines. And then you'll be required to upload 
a letter of commitment uh, from your food service management company. The rest of the application includes the student and community needs section. Within that section, we have the free and reduced price eligibility rate, the child food insecurity rate for your county, and a question on which programs your organization implements to increase food access, like breakfast after the bell. After this student and community needs section, you'll move on to the project narrative section. And we recommend responding to these open-ended questions with three to six sentences with a maximum word count of 200 words. So you can see the, the question um, titles that we, we ask you. And again, go ahead and log in as soon as you're ready um, to see those, those questions. Um, in the application itself. All right, next in the application, you'll come to the budget proposal section. So when I showed you originally the, the grant award amounts and your maximum funding request, uh, this is the first way that we calculate your maximum funding request in the application directly. So you'll add your total lunch count right here in, in this section, and then it will automatically populate your maximum funding request for you below. The maximum funding request includes both food and non-food costs. And then it also calculates your maximum non-food cost for school meals. So as you can see, the 27,000 is just 25% of the 108,000. So it's important to note that the non-food cost is not in addition to the maximum funding request. It's a portion of. Okay, so ensure that the um, the non-food cost that you're, the full, the total that you end up requesting, your non-food costs must be up to 25% or less. Next, you'll move on to complete the food purchasing plan. So you will download the food purchasing plan template, which comes to an Excel spreadsheet. You will follow the instructions on the first tab, save the file and upload it here. So I wanted to show you what that looks like. Here's the second tab of the food purchasing plan, which is the maximum funding calculator. Again, this is a second way that you can double check your maximum funding request. So as you can see here, you will add, if you are a large school district, you would add your total lunch count in the highlighted box and you can see in column F and G that the amount again is 108,000 and the maximum non-food cost is 27,000. Again, if you have any issues with this, please feel free to reach out to me for support. This is the third tab of the food purchasing plan. So keep in mind this purchasing plan is a template and does not substitute for procurement procedures. Before making actual purchases, you must follow all federal, state, and local procurement policies. And a reminder is that this worksheet is for food costs only. If you're requesting non-food costs, they must be added directly into the non-food cost budget section on the application portal. This is set up a little bit differently than last year if you applied last year. Um, so note that we are now organized by product and not by month. So you'll start with the product and specification. So for example, whole rainbow carrots. You'll move on to the expected purchase months. So that's when this item is, seasonal, is seasonally available in Washington and within the grant period. Next is the unit. Units needed and estimated cost per unit. 
So for example, if a farmer sells 50 pound bags of carrots, you know that you need 30 of those bags and each bag costs $25. This last column is auto-populated. It's the units needed times the estimated cost per unit. So do not edit the cells in this column. Okay, so then you will see after you add all of your products, you'll see a total at the bottom. This next tab is the potential vendor list. So again, this is a template, does not substitute for procurement procedures. And so this is potentially who you may purchase from. So you'll start with the vendor name. Who are you paying? Is that a food hub or a distributor? And then you'll add the farmer name, the farmer's location, and answer this question. Are you purchasing directly from the farmer producer or are you purchasing from a food hub or farmer cooperative? So please keep in mind that reviewers will be looking at your food purchasing plan and your potential vendor list and include them in their scoring based on the evaluation criteria that we will cover soon. So you'll save this Excel spreadsheet with the naming convention that we listed in the application and you'll upload it. Next, yep, so there you go, you upload it there. And then next will be to copy the total from the total in your non, sorry, you'll copy the total from your food purchasing plan here. So that's your total requested food costs. If you're only requesting food costs, then you can move on to complete the application. However, if you're re requesting non-food costs, you will need to leave the application section to complete the non-food cost budget section. So I will show you that. So you would save the application as it is, close it, and that will bring you back to this application intake page and you can open the non-food cost budget section. Once you open it, you will see the directions here reminding you that you may request up to 25% of the total requested funding amount for non-food costs. And you will select new item for each unique item that you're requesting. When you hit new item, it will look like this and you will answer a number of questions about the item that you are requesting. Once you are done with that, you will mark complete and you will continue to add those new items. Once you have added all of your non-food cost items, you will come back to this application intake page and head back to the application. Scroll down to this section and you will see that the total requested non-food costs have populated for you. So this number will be pulled from the total of your non-food cost line items. And to add any more, you would return to the non-food cost budget section. You can also see that this percentage is automatically populated for you. So applicants may request up to 25%. Make sure that this number is 25 or less. And then finally, the total requested funding amount is just your food plus your non-food costs. So you're gonna wanna make sure that that is accurate. And you're gonna wanna make sure that the what you're requesting is less than or equal to your maximum funding request. Finally, within the application is the attestations and certifications. Your authorized representative should complete all of these questions and then sign and 
you can save your draft or mark it as complete when you're ready. It's very important to note that to actually submit your application, you have to be on this application intake page and click the submit button. If you do not click the submit button by the deadline, which is Monday, September 25th at 5 p.m., we will not consider you for award. So be sure to click submit here. And if that button is gray, that means that there's certain things that you did not complete in the application. So be sure that you fill everything out. All right. So if you are only applying to one program type, this is what your homepage will look like. You'll have the one application card. But if you're applying to multiple program types, you'll see this add another button and you can do so and it will take you through the same process that we just went through. So that was a quick walkthrough of the submission portal. But if you have any questions, look out for the how to apply video, which will be me going on the browser um, doing the same process step by step. Or feel free to reach out, of course. So a reminder that this is a competitive grant and applications will be evaluated across the following equally weighted criteria. For school meals and child care meals, that is student and community need, support for the grant purpose, and achievability. And for summer meals, that is support for the grant purpose and achievability because we know that summer meals are already reaching high need populations. So let's get into that a little deeper. Student and community need consists of free and reduced price meal eligibility rates or for tribal programs, as well as child food insecurity rate and the use of best practices to increase food access. You will also be evaluated on your support for the grant purpose. So a proposed project supports a grant purpose of increasing the purchase, use, and promotion of foods that are grown in Washington. That includes projects that expand purchasing efforts of Washington foods, projects that purchase directly from small farms, including student engagement, and incorporating menu items that are culturally relevant to the student or child population. Finally, you will be evaluated on achievability. So is the proposed project achievable given support from staff and community partners? Is the budget reasonable and appropriate for the scope and timeline of the project? Is the project strategy clear? And is it uh, incorporating Washington grown foods clearly? And does the project propose to feature Washington products according to seasonality and availability of local products. So I'm going to give an overview of the grant application and award process. This webinar is not a substitute for reading the grant guidelines, which are on the website that detail these processes. Note that the dates are subject to change. So once the application closes on September 25th, we will begin the review process. In October, WSDA will review applicants for eligibility of eligibility and allowable costs, and a grant review team will evaluate applications based on the evaluation criteria. All applicants that operate a USDA child nutrition program will be reviewed by OSPI to ensure that the applicant is currently active and in good standing. Number two is the application complaint process, which is new this year. 
The purpose of the complaint process is to settle unresolved issues or concerns in the application or the application process. So applicants must file complaints regarding the application by the deadline September 25th. After the announcement of the successful applicants, applicants who have not been awarded may request a debriefing conference to discuss the evaluation of their application within three business days of the announcement. If they wish to protest, the applicant must submit their protest in writing within three business days following their debriefing conference. WSDA will perform an objective review of the protest, will assign a neutral party to investigate and respond to the protest. Number three, the grant awards and agreements. WSDA will notify applicants of award or not awarded decisions in November. Grant beneficiaries will receive a grant agreement that they must sign and return to WSDA within seven business days after receiving. Number four is the reimbursement process. So grant funds will be paid to the grant beneficiary on a reimbursement only basis, and they will be required to submit monthly throughout the grant period. Number five is reporting. So grant beneficiaries are required to complete baseline, midterm, and final report surveys. So that's three surveys with across the grant period. Number six is record keeping. So grant beneficiaries must retain records relating to the grant for a period of at least six years from the end of the grant period. And number seven is monitoring requirements. So all grant applicants will be required to answer the questions in the profile about financial capability. Responses to these questions will be used to determine the grant applicant's level of risk. And these questions are not part of the scored application. Upon award, grant beneficiaries will be assigned a risk level and must comply with the monitoring requirements, such as being subject to random desk reviews and turning in receipts for reimbursed items. Again, please read the grant guidelines in full on our website for all of the details. Based on these grant requirements, you can determine if your staff has the capacity to manage this grant. All right, let's talk about pre-application tips. So you can start by engaging your staff, students, and community. Find out what new food and recipes they want to try. Discuss educational and other engagement activities. And you can visit our WSDA Farm to School Toolkit for tips on getting started. Then you can consider what local foods you want to buy next school year. Get started by exploring our Washington seasonality charts for fruit and vegetables. You can also consider grains, eggs, meat, dairy, mushrooms, honey, and other year-round products. Number three is to estimate how much local food you plan to buy. How many different local foods will you serve and how often? In what ways? Maybe as an entree or on your salad bar or as a roasted veggie side. Try to estimate quantities needed for each item and when you plan to serve it. Next is to find sources and prices. So look for farmers in your area using the buy direct from farms resource in our farm to school toolkit. You can check out the Washington Food and Farm Finder or visit local farmers markets. And of course, you can contact us for help connecting with farmers. Next, we recommend connecting with the Washington State Farm to School Network to learn from other farm to school practitioners, create and share resources, set common goals, and amplify the impacts of farm to school for all communities in Washington. Finally, explore the farm to child nutrition program's website from OSPI for resources to support farm to school, farm to summer, farm to CACFP. 
you can consider uh, starting a harvest of the month program or seasonal promotions or even special events. You don't need to serve local foods daily or even weekly to get started. It's really okay to start small and learn as you grow. Wanted to note that this website here in the corner, that's the Eat Local First um, Washington Food and Farm Finder. And they even have a wholesale page for school districts and organizations that are larger to search based on different product type. You can even enter your zip code to see what farmers nearby you uh, deliver. It's a really great resource to get started. So if you have questions about the application process or even local procurement, please feel free to reach out to us at WSDA, Annette or myself, or to OSPI. If you're a child care applicant, you can also reach out to Ray Cooley, who's been a big part of Farm 2 ECE. I can come back to this slide at the end if you want to note all of these emails. We will also have weekly office hours. So if you want to follow up on any questions you have, feel free to register on Zoom. We will have them weekly um, until the application deadline of September 25th. All right. So that leads us to questions. So feel free to unmute yourself or to um, enter any questions into the chat. I see a question. Did you say we can apply now for SSO or did it say there was a later date for that award consideration? Okay, so for summer meals, yes, you would apply now, which is a separate application. It's shorter than the school meals application, um, but you can apply now to receive that funding for next summer. And that's just for school districts right now in round one. I'd love to get a sense um, of those of you who are here if you have already been in the application portal you can respond yes or no. I'd love to, to see if you've already gotten started. And if you haven't gotten started um, and you feel like you want to see the application in a, in a different format, you can reach out to me and I can send you the application in a PDF um, format if that's helpful for you to talk with your team about it. Um, so I'd be happy to do that. Or if you log in and you decide who, which email you're going to use for your login, um, you can actually go to the application and uh, right click to print or, you know, control P to print the, to save the, the application as a PDF and, and print it or use it, um, share it with your team. Looks like we have some people who've gotten started. That's great. That's awesome to hear, Angie, that you're working with your ESD farm to school specialist. Yeah, 
That's a great um, pitch to remember if you're uh, in an ESD that has support for farm to school, I would definitely recommend um, reaching out to them. Um, they're a great resource. Any specific questions coming up about the application? Um, do I have a question? Can you Great. hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Do any of the questions have um, like a higher weight than other questions? Like, is there any category that has more merit or, or more points? That's a great question. Are you with a school district? No, I have an in-home daycare. Okay, daycare. Great. So you'll apply to the Child Care Meals Program. And like I had mentioned, in the evaluation criteria, you'll be evaluated based on the three equally weighted categories, and that's um, your community need, as well as your support for the grant purpose and your achievability. So the reviewers will score your application based on all those long answers that you answer in the application, as well as your food purchasing plan um, and your potential vendor list uh, to, to see how, what your project is. And so it's all those three categories are equally weighted. Equally weighted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see a question from Angie. Will we be handling our own claims and wins this year? So that's a great question. Um, as you saw, we do require a statewide vendor pay number if you are awarded. And that's because WSCA will be paying grantees. So you'll not receive your funds through OSPI apportionment this year. That's that's going to be different. So we won't be using WINS at all. And yes, just like last year, you'll be entering a monthly expenditure report. It's actually going to be on the same portal that uh, you, we would use for the application. Stacy says, looked around a little bit, would like it in PDF. Okay, great. Stacy, if you add your email, I can send them to you in uh, PDF. And you said, I want to get fish into the school for culturally appropriate food. Never done this before. Does WSDA have info on this or your website? Yes. If you're interested in purchasing fish, um, with the grant specifically, we just require that the fish is caught um, in Washington waters. So if you are looking to find a source for your fish, I would recommend starting with the Washington Food and Farm Finder. Um, you can enter fish into the key description and your location and see who's near nearby you and who you want to purchase from. Um, and if you have more specific questions on connecting, definitely we can help support you there. Um, just to add on to that too, Stacey, it's starting to, I'm starting to have some conversations with other tribal producers um, and fishers. Um, so I would love to connect with you. We, we can, if you drop your email or um, I'll put mine in the chat um, to help with that as well. It's kind of a new space. We do have, and from last two years, grantees have been purchasing fish so we can share um, who those producers have been. Um, but there's there's definitely a lot, a lot of other options out there. Annette and Claire, I'm gonna jump in real quick too. Uh, I'm gonna be working with the OSPI 
on a side project of creating a yield study for local salmon. And we're going to begin doing that work next month in September. And part of that will include a video on the yield study process. And I believe we're going to include a few sort of recipe consideration resource ideas into that. So we've been using local salmon now for four cycle years, maybe five, and I'm also willing to help. So Stacy, you can contact me as well in terms of recipe applications. That's great. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here, Tracy. Thank you. Well, I can stay on for any specific questions you might have if you want to ask them. Um, but we can finish off for now. And just I wanted to say thank you all for being here. And remember that deadline of September 25th at 5 p.m. Remember to hit that submit button um, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions.